Welcome, everybody. I'm Dave Falchek. I'm the Executive Director of the American Wine Society. It's great to be here again with Marnie and Donna, who you might remember from our happy hour with uh, Jean Charles earlier. And um, I guess Donna's here. Donna, is there anything you'd like to say before we pass things to Marnie? No, I'm just excited to learn from Marnie, as we all do. Um, every time she speaks, we learn something new. So I have my JCB number 12 port and ready to go when you're ready, Marnie. Fantastic. And just so everyone knows, Donna is going to be serving as my Vanna White tonight. She and I are on opposite ends of the continent, but she's going to be the one keeping an eye on the chat box, keeping track of questions, because we're going to ask those questions, do the Q&A at the end, if that's okay with everyone. Because once I get started teaching, I'm like a freight train. It's hard to slow me down. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> And with that, David, unless there's anything else, I'm just going to go ahead and launch into our tasting. Is that all right? That's fine. Give me a thumbs go ahead. Fantastic. Okay, so first off, we are absolutely thrilled to have such a large group together here. The American Wine Society, clearly you guys are a close-knit group and like socializing. I know we're all feeling a little isolated, so this is a great way for us to be able to all get together, see each other's faces, say hello to each other in the chat box. Feel free to use that to communicate either with the group or with individuals because there is a way to target specific mes messages to people you see who are participating. But as I mentioned earlier, if anybody is seeing the Brady Bunch view or the Hollywood Squares view and wants to see only the person who's speaking, up in the top right hand corner there's a little grid that you can click that will take you to speaker view instead of gallery view and that will give you a clearer view of what we're talking about. Now my name is Marnie Old. I'm a sommelier based in Philadelphia. I'm a wine author. I've been writing for newspapers and teaching about wine. I was the director of wine studies at the French Culinary Institute in Manhattan for a number of years. And now I work as the director of, I call it Vinlightenment for Boisset Collection, because to me that sounds like more fun than wine education. Wine education just sounds like a snore, right? So we're going to do something today that I am best known for. This is the topic that I have been, it's sort of my signature topic. So that's why we chose to do this lesson first. And it's a presentation that I first started out teaching my waiters and bartenders when I was a sommelier in restaurants and then I started teaching aspiring chefs and restaurateurs when I was at the Culinary Institute and now I share this same insight with consumers and wine drinkers like you because you guys need to know the exact same thing that the professionals do and what we're going to be doing is taking a completely different approach to wine and food pairing instead of thinking about things like the protein like whether we're eating fish or meat or chicken or noodles. We are going to be talking about preparation methods, sauces and seasonings. We're going to be drilling down into what I think of as the wine and food chemistry, the sensory science that is underlying all of the interactions of wine and food that we so much love. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because there is a point in the tasting where I'm going to come back to speaking to you one on one like this, but I want to give you a quick run through of the concepts with our part one and then we'll taste together on part two. So I am going to share screen and pull up this PowerPoint deck because we are going to be going through a very, very fascinating aspect of the world of wine and food that is almost never addressed in so many certification programs, so many wine and food, pardon me, so many wine books, they never address the food pairing piece of it, which is of course what we all want to know in the first place. That's why we signed up for the wine class. So today we are going to do something that is a little uncommon, a little unorthodox. I'm calling it a high speed wine tasting, just warning you that we are going to be moving pretty quickly. And that's why I'm thrilled that it's being recorded. That way you all know that if there's something you missed, you can always go back and check out the recording. It usually takes overnight for the Zoom recordings to buffer and upload, so David should be able to share that within a few days. In any case, with that warning in mind, you probably already have these wines. I know that many of these three packs for the AWS, the American Wine Society, were sold through Boisset Collection. So if you have the wines, this is the sequence. We are going to be tasting first the Pinot Noir, JCB number 12 on the left, then we're going to be moving to the 
Buena Vista Petit Sirah that we call the deputy. And then finally finishing with one of our premium wines. This is actually an exclusive to the ambassador program that's called our signature collection Cabernet from Raymond Vineyards in Napa Valley. And many of you, if you visited Napa Valley, you have already visited Raymond. It's one of the top attractions in the entire valley. In any case, I just wanted to put this up on the screen to make sure everybody knew the sequence of the wines that we're going to be tasting. And for those of you who are doing this at home, chances are you already have at least the first four items on this slide ready to go. We talked about you needing some salt, some honey, some lemon, and some butter for this lesson. And of course, if you're feeling adventurous, there are some optional extras too that depending on how frequently you're going grocery shopping, I'm not sure if you already had these in the house or maybe you brought them in specially for us, but we're also going to be doing a little bit of uh, sort of a secondary demonstration with things like tomato, sharp cheese, smoked nuts, dry salami, barbecue potato chips, dill pickles, chocolate chips, and everyone's favorite hot sauce. So if you have these things handy, just so you know, we're going to do the first four in what I'm calling part one of our lecture while we're working through the PowerPoint slide presentation. And then we're going to come back around to those part two foods when we get to that live in-person tasting demonstration part of it. So I just wanted to give everybody some expectations. No, no snacking. Do not sneak ahead. Do not eat those barbecue potato chips. I know that salami and cheese look so tempting, but I want you to hold off for now because we need to taste our first round of wines in the absence of food in order to get kind of a baseline for comparison. So that's what we're going to do. We're asking you to hold off on putting any of these foods in your mouth until I tell you to. It's like a, an adult game of Simon Says with alcohol. Okay, so with that understood, we're going to be talking about wine and food pairing, which even for wine professionals like myself is a challenge. I can't tell you when I became a sommelier how hard it was for me to find resource materials to be able to learn how to recommend pairings. It was really challenging to find anybody willing to put recommendations for wine and food on paper. And so if it's hard for professionals, you can imagine that for wine drinkers, it's a daunting task just trying to decide what to drink with dinner. Now, I think of wine and food decisions as being divided up into a few different choice buckets, right? So there's the no pairing approach at all, which is, you know, I like Cabernet Sauvignon and I'm going to drink it with everything, whether it's oysters or a piece of steak. That's the no pairing and choose only by personal preference. And then there's people who choose based around, you know, the time of day or the time of year, not so much around what they're eating. And that's actually a pretty good approach, believe it or not, just knowing whether the sun is high in the sky or whether it's nighttime does wonders for helping you pick the right wine, as does knowing whether it's springtime, fall, winter, summer, all of those things. That all makes perfect sense. And that's a good way to do pairing. It is a better way to do pairing, and this is what most people with the level of experience that the American Wine Society member would have probably do, is to do what I call ballpark matching to the weight and intensity of the main ingredients. This means using the fact of having a salad versus a heavier risotto to decide whether you're going to drink a lighter wine or a heavier wine, right? But what we're talking about today is in purple here, what I call the best pairing approach, and that is to factor in the food chemistry of the individual dish you're about to eat. And that means looking at the seasoning, looking at the sauce, looking at the cooking methods, and of course the cuisine style as well. So there's no way that we're going to get all the way through all of this material. We're going to be hitting the highlights as we go and try to make sure that you guys move into your next meal, into your next dinner party with a little bit of what I think of as sort of tricks of the trade or sommelier secrets to putting together the best wine and food partnerships. Now, it is important to remember, though, I don't want to give the impression that there is one single right answer to any question of pairing, because the number of wine options and food options and the variables are just almost infinite. It can get overwhelming to even think about. And, of course, then there's the other chaos factor, which is that individual tastes, our individual preferences in wine and food can vary widely as well. This is partly based on personal taste, like I can't predict which wine you're going to like best out of this group of three any more than I could guess at your personal preferences in music or art or fashion. 
but there's also a certain amount of genetic, like biological variation, physiological variation there as well, in the sense that some people are simply more sensitive to smells and tastes in the same way that some of us have very poor vision and of others are, you know, eagle dot, eagle eyed 2020. Some of us have more sensitivity or lack of sensitivity to certain kinds of flavors and smells, and that can affect our preference in wine dramatically, as you can imagine. But the thing we're here to talk about today is the universal piece of this. The mechanics of sensation are universal because we are all human beings. We have the same basic equipment and the biology of sensation works the same way for all of us. Even if our individual sensitivities and our individual personal preferences can vary dramatically from one person to the next. So this means that we can learn about those basic patterns to do something that I call not what not to wear, it's what not to pair. I actually think, and certainly I teach this way, that it's more important to learn how to avoid clashes than it is to learn how to find the perfect pairing because there are more paths to harmony, certainly for a wide range of people with different tastes than you might imagine, but there are a fairly predictable set of bad combinations that any of us can learn to avoid once we understand the basic sensory science behind the combination of wine and food. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So I'm going to be teaching you to think like a sommelier using the Boisset Collection Spectrum of Style. And we will introduce this concept as we go. It's going to teach you to think beyond fish versus meat when you're deciding what to drink with dinner. And frankly, I've got to tell you, nobody believes me when I say this until we finish the lesson and you've done the demonstrations. It's far more important to think about salty versus sweet because this is the single most important variable to factor in when you're deciding what to drink. It has to do with the sauce, it has to do with the seasoning more often than it does with the protein at the heart of the plate. So let's get started. We are going to first taste all three of the wines without food, as I mentioned. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to pick up each one and we're going to kind of get a baseline for comparison. So what we're going to do is assess our first impressions of these three wines. I have the JCB number 12 in my glass. And when I give this a look with the eyes, I can see it's translucent, classic Pinot Noir, not terribly dense and opaque. On the nose, uh, you know, you would be forgiven questioning whether this wine is California or French because it definitely has that understatement, that bright, tangy red fruit smell, and that thread of earthiness that we associate with European Pinot Noir. But when we give it a taste, mm, dry on the tip of the tongue, bracingly refreshing down the sides with acidity, exactly what we associate with this style. Now, the spectrum of style is something that we use at Boisset to sort our wines into kind of a color-coded navigation system. And we think of this style that you just tasted, the JCB number 12, as being right in the middle. The one that's in red there, we call it elegant. This is what we classify as our most traditional European style wines. So whether they come from France or from California, if they have that French inspired style, we call them elegant, meaning that they have higher level of acidity, lower level of sugar, often modest level of alcohol, and often noticeable tannin. Does everyone notice you can feel the grip of this wine on the inside of your mouth? It feels a little bit like someone uh, dabbed off your tongue with a paper towel. That's a little tannin coming through, which we associate more with traditional wines than we do with the modern California style. Now on the spectrum of style, we're not going to talk about the first two categories today because they're white, but we will taste through elegant, sensuous, and powerful. And that's why I chose these three wines to put in on our AWS pack for our life. So the spectrum of style, we just tasted the Pinot Noir, the elegant. We're going to move through sensuous and powerful with the next two wines. And then we're going to go back and retaste these same wines with some of the foods that we have ready to see if our perception, our first impressions of these wines change dramatically. In part one that we're going to do with our PowerPoint slides, we're going to illustrate the basics of sensory science using food staples like salt, honey, lemon, and butter. And then after that, we're going to move to part two that, well, we'll turn off the slideshow for this to demonstrate the real world applications of optional extra foods like the tomato and cheese and salami and nuts and and so on. Okay. So 
As I mentioned, JCB number 12, French inspired style made in the Burgundian method of making Pinot Noir, but in this case in Sonoma County, California. It is very much a dry traditional food oriented style that comes from cool climate sites in the Russian River Valley in Sonoma Coast. And JCB number 12, if we talk about it purely on a sensory level, like what's happening when I put it in my mouth, it is a wine that is very dry, it's very acidic, high in acidity, it has bright red fruit flavors with kind of an herbal earthy backdrop in terms of the aromatic accents. You'll notice though that there's very little flavor of new oak barrels because only 10% new oak is generally used in this cuvee. And that's very much in line with the way the French use oak in the Burgundy region. It's a medium bodied wine, so mid-weight in texture and does have some firm tannin, but they're not at a high level. They are kind of medium in range. Now let's compare this to our next wine, wine number two. So, oh, pardon me, this, as I mentioned, is elegant category on our Boisset spectrum of style. So now let's compare this to wine number two. This is the wine that we call the Deputy, which is named after the founder of Buena Vista, the famous Count of Buena Vista in the 1850s. And when you give this wine a swirl and a sniff, first of all, you'll see right away, it's dark purple. It's a much deeper color coming from a thicker skinned grape variety. It also smells more like desserts and less like earthly herbal things the way the Pinot Noir did because it's made in a softer, modern and more fruit driven style. And in part, what we can smell, you can almost close your eyes and smell the sunshine. We're smelling fruit ripeness. We're smelling a wine that is made from grapes that hung, hung long enough on the vine to develop very high levels of color in the skins, very high levels of flavor. It's almost like, that's why it smells more, almost more like blueberry pie than a fresh blueberry, right? Some of the vineyards here are located in the Central Valley, which gives us a lot of warmth. That's the extra ripeness coming from Lodi. Now, compared to the Pinot Noir flavor-wise, I gotta tell you, when we taste this wine, right away at the tip of the tongue, you notice a whisper, a hint. I call it borderline off dry. This is a style of red wine that is pleasing and easy drinking in part because it has a whisper of sweetness. A touch of unfermented grape sweetness is noticeable on the tip of the tongue. It's also noticeably less acidic than the Pinot Noir with riper, jammier fruit flavors that have almost a kind of spice, like a star anise kind of a quality to them. And you do notice a little bit more new oak flavor, but the mid-weight texture is, is similar. We're still talking about a medium bodied wine here, just as we were with wine number one. But if you pay attention to what's happening in the mouth, you'll notice there's hardly any of that pat your tongue off with a towel feeling. There's very soft tannin in this wine, which is one of the things that makes us decide at Boisset to classify this wine as a sensuous red wine. Our sensuous red wines are not as acidic, not as tannic, not as traditional, and certainly not quite as dry as our elegant wines. And the sensuous category I think of these as the, you know, the wines you want to pull a cork on and drink when you come home from work before you're even sitting down for dinner. You just had a bad day and you need a glass of wine. Sensuous is the perfect style for this because it doesn't need food. It's fine just by itself to enjoy all on its own. And this is quite different in terms of its flavor profile from our example of the powerful category, which is going to be our next wine, the number three. Number three is our Raymond Signature Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa Valley. And I chose this wine because it's a beautiful illustration of what I think of as luxury red wines, wines that have spent more time in newer oak barrels, wines that come from more prestigious terroirs with lower yields that are designed to be age worthy, meaning that they can resist oxidation enough to continue to improve in the cellar over time. Now, when you pick up glass number three and swirl the, well, first of all, it's like ink. It's not a vibrant purple like wine number two was, but it has this beautiful saturation, this density. I cannot see the lines of my hand through this wine. And when you give it a smell, I, you guys have been around the block in the wine business. You know, does anybody else notice when you smell this wine? Can you smell the money? I can smell the money. This is from much more expensive real estate. This is made with much more expensive hand craftsmanship. It's aged in much more expensive French oak barrels. And I've got to tell you, we are lucky. This Raymond signature that I mentioned being exclusive to the ambassador program is made with predominantly fruit from our own biodynamically farmed vineyards in Napa Valley. There are so few biodynamic wineries in the United States. And in this case, it makes up Roughly 85% of the blend is from our own estate biodynamic fruit. And that's one of the reasons that when you taste this wine, mm. it is really good. 
you're going to notice more concentration of flavor. You're going to notice much more character, much more, just feel the finish on this baby. It's going to keep going in your mouth. You're going to be able to taste it for much longer than we did with the two previous wines. It's just made at a higher quality level. And quality. all of that concentration that comes from the compounds in the skins that gives it that no, depth of color, it also that gives it that concentration of flavor, right? So when we talk about what makes this taste different on a purely taste level rather than winemaking, this wine is just as dry as the Pinot Noir. It has almost as high a level of acidity as well. You can feel that almost laminate or cranberry zing down the sides of the tongue. That's a preservative and definitely something that high quality winemakers are looking to preserve high levels of acidity in their top red wines. However, it has the ripeness and black fruit flavors and kind of cocoa and vanilla smells that we associate with top of the line Cabernet Sauvignon and Bordeaux blends. It also has a much higher level of new oak, not just new oak, but new French oak. And that's part of where we're getting that almost cognac-like quality in the flavor of the wine. In terms of texture, it is also higher in alcohol content, which gives us more viscosity, gives us more richness. It feels like a heavier wine in the mouth. And when we pay attention to the tannins, I want you to notice something very interesting. We get a lot of grip in that sense that your tongue has been dried off. But instead of being dried off with a paper towel, this time it's like it's been enveloped in cashmere or, you know, wrapped in velvet. You know, there's a velvety texture to high quality wines when they have high levels of tannin. We need to soften their impact to make them more appealing on first sip as with this wine. So I want everybody to kind of think about these three wines and think about that idea of elegant versus sensuous versus in this case, the powerful category, which tends to reflect our most intense, our most age worthy wines. Unfortunately, that does mean that they do cost a little more. So for example, whereas the JCV number 12 Pinot Noir, the frontline retail price would be $40 and the Deputy Petit Syrah would be 28. This one is a little higher at 58 because of the higher quality fruit and the higher level of craftsmanship and ingredients that are used here. However, of course, don't forget that AWS members, there is a coupon code, I, I'll ask Donna to chat it in so that you guys can write it down to make sure that you get 10% all off all of your Boisse purchases just for being a member. And she'll include the link there too, so you can get straight to the website and make those kinds of bargain purchases. In any case, what we're going to do now is we're going to revisit each of these wines. We're going to go back to wine number one, and we're going to revisit them with some of our staples that we talked about. So what I want everybody to do is grab wine number one and find on your tasting mat the salt. This time, I, it's almost like I want you guys to pretend you're doing a shot of tequila and get a little sprinkle of salt right on your tongue. Mm. You don't need a lot. You just need a little bit. Just get a little touch of salt there so that you notice it. Let those crystals dissolve. And then what I want everyone to do is I want everyone to think about uh, how this wine tasted on the first sip, on your first impression, and now compare it again now after the salt. Mm. And notice that this does something very interesting. This wine was quite dry and quite acidic, and now it seems less dry and less acidic because salt interferes with the taste buds on your tongue that perceive those things. And this is the single most important lesson of today's pairing. It will happen with each one of the wines that we taste. Salt makes wines taste less acidic and more fruit driven, more fruity than they do on their own. But salt is not the only seasoning that we use. I want everybody, after you've recovered for a moment from that pinch of salt, I want you to repeat the same experience, but do it with a dab of honey instead this time. Now I have my little shot glass of honey and I have some toothpicks here. You do not need a lot of honey. Just get a little dab on the tip of your tongue. Mm -hmm. And go back to the same wine, the first wine we tasted, JCB number 12, the Pinot Noir. And this time take a sip of this wine again after the honey. Oh wow, see how that changed? The honey sensitizes your tongue to the acidity in the wine. It makes it seem much, much sharper than it even did on first sip. So the salt took the edge off the acidity and the honey is amplifying that acidity 
Hmm, let me tell you something. This is something that every sommelier worth his salt knows. This is something that every chef worth his salt knows. And that most wine drinkers might know through experience of eating salty food with wine, but haven't actually internalized in the sense of doing a simple demonstration like this. And trust me, this is a great party trick. You can do this in any restaurant, any bar. I know Donna does it all the time at her favorite steakhouse, showing people how this works. Taking a little pinch of salt will reduce the perceived acidity. Taking a little dab of honey or sugar will make a wine seem more acidic. This is so important to know because it explains so much about the way that they made wine for centuries in Europe as compared to the way we make wine now today in the New World, places like California. Well, think about it. Historically, wines were not designed to be consumed in and of themselves. They were sauce on the side. They were an accompaniment for food. And historically, the classic approach in places like France, Italy, and Spain was to make your wines a little too acidic on first sip so that they would taste just right once the food came out to the table, right? Because there's salt in everything we eat. The only question is how much? Whereas in the new world, we have to orient much more around first impressions. We have to make sure people love the wine on first sip. They aren't gonna wait to get past that first sip to sit down and enjoy the wine at the table with different food items. So the thing to remember is that salt makes wine seem less acidic and more fruity. This is super flattering to this Pinot Noir because it takes that kind of acquired taste, lean, dry, sharp, and earthy, earthy edge and lets the wine taste more generous, richer, and fruitier after the salt. But sugar will take the same wine and spin 180 degrees in the other direction, make it seem more acidic and less fruity. Now, this is a challenge for a wine like wine number one because our elegant wines need salty food to really be put in their proper context and can seem a little too earthy, a little too uh, brittle. It can make them seem a little thin and sour when you put them next to foods that are high in sugar. And this is why I was talking about forget fish versus meat. Salty versus sweet is by far a more important consideration when you're deciding what to drink with dinner. And I'll show you the applications of these things a little bit later when we come back to part two. So let's keep going. Let's find, oh, actually, here's our summary. Almost all wines are flattered by foods that are high in salt, like this elegant wine, but very few wines are flattered by foods that are high in sugar. There is an exception to this. There is a way to get around it that I'll illustrate in a minute, but generally speaking, salt is every wine's best friend. It makes almost all of them taste better, and it puts them in a better context, especially wines that seem a little too aggressive, a little too dry, a little too sharp on first sip, try them with salty food. That's why we do wine and cheese parties, but not wine and cupcake parties or wine and Girl Scout cookie parties. People, please don't do this. It's a bad thing. Don't do it. Just don't do it. Okay, so let's continue on. And this time, let's do the same demonstration we just did with the first wine, with the Pinot Noir, but let's do it with the Petite Syrah, the wine number two, instead of wine number one. So find your Petite Syrah. I know you have it there somewhere. I will forgive you. You can turn off your cap, your uh, video if you want to drink straight out of the bottle. That's a-okay. You can just get a straw out of the kitchen. No shame here. Mm. Now, when we first tasted the Buena Vista, this Deputy Petit Syrah, as I mentioned, is easy drinking, fun and fruity. It's got so much kind of borderline sweetness right up front. It's got a lot in common with the super popular California red blends right now, even though it is a Petit Syrah varietal wine. But I want you to find your honey again. And this time, you'll notice that the same effect has a different result when you have a different wine in the glass. So, little bit of honey. Go back to your wine number two, the Deputy Petit Syrah. Hmm. Now, isn't that funny? This wine, to my taste, I tend to prefer drier wine. So I preferred both the Pinot Noir and the Cabernet Sauvignon over this Petit Syrah on its own. But I'll tell you, this makes it taste like a classic dry wine, doesn't it? Because remember what we said, the sugar makes the wine seem more acidic and less fruity. Well, to my taste, my personal taste, I, I'm not saying that everyone should agree with this, but to my taste, this wine was a little too fruity and not quite acidic enough. 
So the sugar actually puts this wine in closer to a happy place rather than giving it, uh, throwing it under the bus the way it did with wine number one. The Pinot Noir was too dry and too acidic naturally to be able to handle honey, but the Petit Syrah from Buena Vista sure can handle itself some sugar. That's exactly what it is designed to do. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But next, I want to contrast this effect. The honey, what does it do? It makes this wine seem drier so that we notice more of the tannins and we notice more of the structure behind this wine. It actually gives it kind of a gloss of seriousness, whereas a minute ago, this wine was kind of, uh, I don't know, it was like a bubble head. You know what I mean? It was, it was fun and, and all about hedonistic pleasure. And now it's kind of showing its more serious side when you put it next to something sweet. Well, this time I want you to find the piece of lemon and grab yourself a piece of lemon. You do not need to eat the lemon. All I want you to do is just touch it to your tongue enough to notice the zing. Zoom! There it is. That zing of acidity that we get from citrus fruit, lemon, lime, grapefruit, they all kind of do the same thing. But what I want you to do is get that zing of acidity of the citrus fruit of the lemon into your mouth and now come back and taste the same wine, the Buena Vista and the Deputy, a second time. Oh my, isn't that interesting? Our senses are not equipped to process two sources of the same information. So when both the wine are, both the wine and the food have sugar, as we had with the honey and with the slightly sweet red wine, then they're both gonna seem less sweet together, not more sweet. This is just how our senses operate. Our senses are not like bank accounts. It's not like one plus one equal, always equals two. In this case, it's one plus one equals zero. Okay, because when you put this wine next to something that has some similar level of sweetness, like the honey, then both of them taste less sweet together than they did apart. But if you then compete with a different flavor, bringing in acidity, what does it do? It competes with the acidity in the wine and makes it taste less acidic than it even did on first sip. So now what happens? The wine tastes sweet again, right? Did you notice that? This wine all of a sudden, after the lemon, to me, it starts tasting like, you remember those old IHOP uh, fresh and fruity, rooty tooty breakfasts where they had the three different kinds like raspberry, strawberry, and blueberry syrups? That's what this tastes like to me now. It almost tastes like pie filling, like uh, jam, like syrup, because by putting it next to something acidic, we make it taste less naturally acidic, which pushes forward the flavors of fruit and sweetness. Does that make sense? I hope I'm making sense. You guys can let me know if I'm not making sense, but that's what uh, Donna will wave both hands at me to let me know because <laughs> I my chat box is closed. In any case, so the Buena Vista the Deputy, when we retaste this wine with a taste of lemon instead of the sweetness, it makes it taste very, very sweet. It's very interesting how you can completely change your perception of wine just by doing this simple little demonstration. And we are going to keep going because acidity will always make wine seem heavier and less acidic. Whether you like the result or don't like the result, that's a matter of personal preference. That's going to depend on whether you like the wine that you're tasting. It's going to depend on your personal preference. Like for example, with that wine number two, whether you like it better with the honey or with the lemon, I'm guessing that there are people out there tasting with us where two halves of the same couple might actually disagree about that because that's a matter of personal preference. But what I want you to understand and take away today is that there is a human biological pattern that's present here. Acidity on your tongue coming from the food will always make the wine seem a little heavier and a little less acidic. Sweetness coming from the food will always make the wine seem a little drier and so on. So these patterns are human biology. Whether you like the results or not, that's something that you're going to have to learn to apply out there in the world of sensation and see what works for you. But what I normally say is that the best wines for sweet foods are wines that have some sweetness themselves. Now, in the case of red wines, we very rarely have high sugar in reds unless it's port. So that's why I chose this fun and fruity Petit Syrah to give us something that had at least a whisper of sweetness to demonstrate that fact.
Whereas low acid wines like this one are generally poorly equipped for foods that are high in acidity. This wine does not taste better after the lemon to me. In fact, the lemon would work better with the Pinot Noir because generally speaking, when you have high levels of sweetness in a wine, you wanna choose a high sugar wine. When you have high levels of acidity in a food, you wanna choose a high acid wine. It's always like with like people. I know you can do this. It's like matching your belt and your shoes you can do this. We generally, in the world of wine and food, put like with like, not because we want to make things taste more sweet or more acidic, but because we actually want those two things to balance each other out and let the other flavors in the wine and in the food come through. So let's go through and finish part one with the end. We're going to go to our wine number three, that Raymond signature. And I apologize, Donna. I know this is one of your favorite wines, and I'm so sorry to do this, but it's all in the interests of science. We're going to first make this wine taste not right before we can make it taste its best. Is that okay? I can see you smiling and nodding. So in any case, I want people to remember their first impression of this beautiful signature Napa Valley Cabernet from Raymond. And this time, what we're going to do is taste and retaste this with that same piece of lemon that we used for the previous wine, for the Petit Syrah. Just a little zing of lemon and come back to your Cabernet Sauvignon. Wow, it makes it heavier. It makes it seem less acidic. And what that does is it emphasizes the tannin and the alcohol really comes forward. There's a reason why we do not generally pour ourselves a glass of Cabernet with the same foods that we squeeze lemon on. It just doesn't really work. There's a reason why we normally pour ourselves a glass of Sauvignon Blanc or bubbles or of something more acidic. This type of wine is not designed to handle vinegar, lemon, or any of those high acid sources like a uh, green tomato or something like that in a recipe. But what is it designed to handle? I'm sure you can bet that the last item on our food staples, our butter, I have my little spoon here. I'm going to get myself some butter. I'm going to get a little dab of butter. I'm going to let that melt right on my tongue. Mm. Oh man, butter's just good, isn't it? Okay, and now come back to your Cabernet Sauvignon after the butter. Oh, <laughs> this is what the winemakers were aiming for in the first place. This kind of wine good. doesn't just need salt, it also needs fat. And in fact, I can show you how happy this is in your average steakhouse. Take your butter dish, go into the salt that you already had, take a little pinch of salt and put extra salt on your butter. Just do it right now. I'm, I'm going to show you how you take some extra salt, put it on your butter. Uh-huh. And now take another taste of extra salty butter. Mmm. Mmm. Sort of like what they're doing at Morton's with your steak, right? A little butter before it hits the grill, a little more when it comes off. Mmm. Oh, wow. See how that works? Wines like this are not designed to go with foods that are high in acidity. They're designed to go with foods that are high in fat. That's why rich food goes so well with rich full-bodied wines like this, because the fat makes the wine seem lighter and brighter. This wine was almost ponderous, a little too heavy to drink on its own if you were just sitting outside on a warm day. But put it next to a beautifully grilled steak with a little melted herb butter on top. Put it next to some duck confit. Put it next to some risotto. Put it next to, even if you don't feel like cooking, just get yourself a charcuterie board. Put out some cheese. Put out some meats. Get something with a high level of fat content and all of a sudden this wine is in its happy place. That's exactly what this wine is designed to do. Now, Traditional wines like this one work best with foods that are high in salt and fat. As I said, there's a reason why we have wine and cheese parties because cheese is the best way to deliver both fat and salt at the same time without having to cook. You just put it out on a plate, give your guests some forks and you're done, right? You've got something that's gonna flatter almost any wine. 
but very, very few wines are designed in a way that they can be flattered by sugar and spice. And this is something we're gonna learn a little bit more about when we get into part two, but trust me on this. Sugar and spice, not so nice when it comes to your high quality wines. Generally speaking, they do not play well with each other. Okay, so a few other things that I want to talk about before we finish part one here, and that is the browning effect of the cooking process. Whenever we cook food, just, just kind of close your eyes and imagine what happens when you drop, you know, raw scallops in a pan full of hot butter, they brown on the outside, or bake a loaf of bread in the oven, the heat browns the crust, or a piece of lamb or steak on the grill. The browning effect that takes place with the application of heat has a distinctive flavor, and when that flavors present in foods when they are cooked in a method that has browning. So, I mean, not boiled, not steamed, right? I mean, grilled, sauteed, roasted, baked, and so on. The flavors that develop in the brown part of the food have a distinctive flavor that is very similar to the taste that's imparted to wine by aging in oak barrels. It's one of the reasons that unoaked wines go so well with things like sushi and ceviche and salads. It's because the flavors of the cooking process evoke and echo and balance out beautifully the flavors of oakiness in wine. So even if Chardonnay tastes too oaky to you by itself, I you know, take a piece of of salmon, wrap it in bacon, drop it in a pan of hot butter, and then you tell me it's not delicious with that oaky Chardonnay. The flavors of cooking, the flavors of smoking, the flavors of sauteing, all of those are designed to balance and offset the oakiness that we encounter in some wine styles in a very delicious and harmonious way. But there are also a couple other things that I want to make sure that we touch on before we move to the next section. We're going to do a demonstration on spicy heat. I don't know what your tolerance is for hot sauce. Personally, I am a hot sauce wimp, so I brought pranks instead of sir chow or, you know, something stronger. I, I am a, a bit of a spicy heat wimp, but spicy heat makes strong dry wines taste harsh. It definitely makes them seem more tannic and can make them almost painful in the mouth. And we'll be illustrating why when we get into part two. And that's the end of this section. We are going to take a quick break. I know that I have not had my chat box open, so I'm going to ask my trusty Vanna White which is Miss Donna, to let me know if we can, pardon me, if we can answer any quick questions before we continue on. We do have another section, but I want to give people a break and give them a chance to have those questions answered. Um, so far, no questions. One person wants to know if they'll receive a copy of the PowerPoint. So that oh, I'm happy to share that, David. So when you post your recording, um, just remind me if I haven't, I can send you a PDF version of the presentation and that way people can do their own revisitation of all of these pairings. I know we've been moving very quickly. Yes, but also if, if Savan had missed it, we are recording the session and we hope to be able to share it on our AWS YouTube page or via email. And we just had some and comments about some great evening and love the pairings very interesting and fun and everyone's talking oh. about what we have for dinner with it things like that well i will tell you we are going to get even more interesting from here because what we're going to do is we've just been sharing with you some very very surface level highlights of the basics of sensory science and the thing to remember is that generally speaking two sources of similar sensation do not add up to seem stronger. There's only one exception to that rule that I know of, and it has to do with tan and in food, which doesn't happen very often. We don't usually eat things like hops that have a high level of tannin. We don't usually uh, do that, but there are a couple things, like for example, the skins on walnuts. If you have walnuts that have skins on them in a dish and eat that tannic, that the feeling is very similar to a strong, like a highly tannic French or Italian red wine on the inside of the mouth. If you have that plus a tannic red wine at the same time, it's like tannin overload. But that's the exception to the rule. Nine out of 10 times, I'm telling you, sensation operates more like one plus one equals zero. So if you have sweetness in the food and sweetness in the wine, they will both taste less sweet together. If you have acidity in the food and acidity in the wine, they will both taste less acidic together. And when we talked about that, I just want to take a moment to reinforce what I'm talking about is texture, the heft, the mouthfeel. Think about it. If anybody cooks at home, you already know that adding olive oil or butter to a sauce makes it feel richer on the inside of the mouth, right? 
Well, in wine, the thing that makes wine feel richer on the inside of the mouth in the same way is alcohol content. So alcohol content and fat content can be kind of thought of as like with like. Generally, the easiest, simplest wine pairing advice I know of is to look at the small fine print on the back of a wine label and look at that alcohol content, just knowing that like 14 and, pardon me, 13 and a half to 14 is the, the norm, the medium. The higher the level of alcohol is above that level, the more fat content and richness you want to have in the dish that pairs with it. And the lower that alcohol content is below 13, they're getting down to 12, 10, 9 in the case of a German wine, the lower the fat content should be in the dish. It's the simplest, easiest pairing method ever. You go by numbers. <laughs> In any case, like with like, I'm telling you, there are other paths to a positive, delicious pairing, but none are this easy to predict in the sense that anyone could get the hang of getting this right, picking wines that are going to flatter their foods if they stick to these kind of ballpark, big picture seasoning questions about salt, about acidity, about fat content, and so on. So, okay, so I think everybody's ready for part two then, right? And I know not everyone is going to have these foods, but I know the recording is available. I know that you guys are going to be able to get our PDF deck, and I, we're more than happy to flesh out. Oh, and I can see David has all 12 of his foods ready in front of him. I'm sure he is not alone. We have so many people on this call. It's amazing. We have 82 of you joining, and I know you're not all individuals in homes, so we're probably well over 200 people in this group. But what I want to do is I want to give you guys some back and forth it's almost like um, do's and don'ts, right? So we are going to essentially enter what I think of as the Simon Says portion of tonight's evening, <laughs> you know, where we put together both positive and negative pairings, clashes, to show you what it is that sommeliers are thinking when we're deciding what to put together. So we're going to do this one wine at a time in the same way that we went through our part one, by first tasting the Pinot Noir and then tasting the Petit Syrah and then finally coming to the Cabernet Sauvignon, we're gonna go back now to our Pinot Noir, which was our JCB number 12. So this is wine number one, if you're using your tasting mat, and this is our elegant wine, the one that had the very French sensibilities, understated, elegant, and earthy. Now, taste this wine again. Just remind yourself what this tasted like on its own. Mm. So at the tip of the tongue, quite dry, down the sides of the tongue, quite acidic, and on the lighter end of the red wine spectrum overall, more red fruit and herbs and less of that dark oak flavor or black fruit flavor. Now what I want you to do is if you have all of your foods, find your sharp cheese. David, I know you have it in front of you because I can see it, but just get a little nib it, nibble of that sharp cheese. You don't need much just enough to feel it around the inside of the mouth, feel the te texture, the fat content coating the tongue. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Oh, I have an amazing Canadian eight-year-old cheddar. It is fantastic from Balderson's. Oh, so good. And when you retaste the same wine, come back to the same wine number one, the Pinot Noir after the cheese. What I want you to notice is how it does the same thing the salt did. It softens the wine, makes it seem fruitier, less acidic, less lean, makes it seem much easier to drink. But there is a whole raft of foods that we want to avoid with a wine like this. Elegant wines can handle salt and fat, no problem. But what can they not handle? Find your barbecue potato chips. I know they're there. Barbecue potato chips. So is there salt and fat here? Hell yes. However, there is also loads of sugar and spice and smoke. Now come back to the Pinot Noir after the barbecue chips. Ooh, this is not something that I would recommend in a restaurant. <laughs> Generally speaking, yes, yes, I can see your bag. <laughs> in any case, the sugar and spice is offsetting the presence of the salt and fat and is it's kind of hollowing out the wine, making it seem thin and sharp and kind of tinny to me. It is not this wine's best look, let's put it that way. I would definitely be pairing this wine with foods that are higher in salt and fat, and it can even handle acidity. We'll come back to that in a moment. Now, those two 
combinations really help us illustrate the basics that I was talking about. Salt and fat, definitely a plus for almost all dry wines. Sugar and spice, usually a no, right? But there are wines here that can handle that. As a matter of fact, do you have one in the next glass? Wine number two, pick up glass number two again. This was our Petite Syrah. Mm. On its own, this is the jammy, almost pie filling flavor that we had in this easy drinking wine. We call it the Deputy. It's our Buena Vista Petite Syrah from the sources are all over from Sonoma County to Lodi. Now try another barbecue potato chip this time. Mm. Now go back to this wine number two. And I gotta tell you, this wine can handle it. The barbecue flavor throws the Pinot Noir under the bus. And trust me, it's just as unflattering to the Cabernet. But the one wine with the least pretension on the table, who would have guessed it, can actually work well with the food with the least pretension too. The reality is that we often in the wine world, it's, it's tempting when you've acquired a taste for fine wines and fine dining to kind of look down on the huddled masses drinking their white Zinfandel and their, their sweeter red blends. But I have to tell you, millions of Americans are not wrong about wine and food pairing. It's just that they're eating foods that are higher in sugar and spice than you think they are. And they need a little more sugar content in their wine in order to balance that sugar out. If, if you use ketchup, for example, if you're putting barbecue sauce on anything, you almost need over sweetness in your wine to make that combination taste good. And if you're not someone who likes those sauces, chances are that you're going to want to stick more to the pairing of traditional drier wines with more of the salt and fat driven cuisine that we find in Europe. Think about it this way. I used to teach in a culinary school. There are three ingredients you can add to any dish to make it taste better. A little salt, a little fat, a little sugar. Those three things, you could add it to breakfast, lunch, dinner. You could add it to baked goods. You could add it to seafood. You could add it to meat, to vegetables, to noodles. Doesn't matter. A little salt, a little fat, a little sugar makes everything taste a little more delicious, right? But in Europe, in the regions where wine was on the table at every meal, they tend to use salt and fat more and to hold back on the sugar in their cuisine. Why? Because it made their wine taste funny, right? Realistically, what unites French cuisine, Spanish cuisine, German cuisine, Italian cuisine, they tend to use salt and fat during the main meal and save sugar for breakfast and dessert because they like to drink wine. Those are the things that are kind of unifying principles. But the minute we get outside of Europe, and let's be honest, most of us in the United States did not grow up with wine on the table at every meal. That certainly is not true in Asia either, or in the Southern Hemisphere, or in Scandinavia. As soon as you get outside of the wine drinking part of Europe, what do you see happen to the cuisine? Salt, fat, and sugar in equal measure in all of the recipes. They are using more sugar because there's no wine on the table to cause them to hold back and restrict it to breakfast and dessert. Okay, so let's keep going. We have another final wine. Let's go to our Cabernet Sauvignon, which was our wine number three, the beautiful Raymond signature. Mm. Now in this case, this wine is so rich, so mouth filling. I hate to kind of show it in a negative light before we put it back in the, in the light here, but I want everybody to find your cherry tomatoes and just take a bite of raw tomato. And then try the Cabernet again. Now, a lot of people think this combination is going to be great. Red food, red wine, what could be wrong? They want to match by color. But I got to tell you, this does not leave this wine in a good place, does it? The, I can see the look on your face, David. You are not enjoying this. This is What's happening is the natural acidity that's present in the fresh tomato is eviscerating this poor Cabernet Sauvignon. It is not designed for this. It can handle a cooked tomato. It can handle a buttered tomato. It can handle a tomato that is roasted with melted cheese, but it cannot handle a raw tomato to save its life. And if you put a vinaigrette on it, it will get worse. <laughs> Trust me on this. If you squeeze it with lemon, it's gonna get worse. Generally speaking, young, fresh foods especially those that are high in acidity, need to be put with high acid, fresh young wines that have not aged in barrels. That's generally the best possible plan for partnership. 
But what is this wine craving? I know there's something on the table this wine wants. And yes, it would be great with the cheese. Don't get me wrong. But find your salami. Yeah. <laughs> Where, ah, that is. Well, let's see. She's almost done. And let's see if there's any way you can rerun. If not, if you can. I think there's some folks who are not muted. So just, you know, we're hearing you. You can um, hit your mute button in the bottom left corner. Donna, Flavor. Marnie muted. We don't want Marnie muted. Yeah. There we go. Good. Let oh, go. that's exactly what this wine is for, right? This is designed, this has all, it hits all of the buttons. This, this is what the wine is designed to do. And if you really want to see the best possible example, you can take a little bite of that salami and add a little nugget of the cheese and then sprinkle on some salt and add some of your salted butter. You could go all the way to the fine dining level of fat and salt content. Mm. Yum, 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 yum. I know it seems like a, a marriage made in hell, but it actually tastes really awesome together, doesn't it? I remember the first time I had a uh, ham sandwich in France that had salt and butter on it instead of mayonnaise. Brilliant. Now come back to your Cabernet this time. This is my way of faking the steakhouse experience. Yes! That's exactly what this wine, see how much softer, how much more understated, how much smoother this wine is in this context. It is craving more salt and more fat and more intensity of flavor than we can possibly give it with most other foods. So this is something that I have been teaching for decades. I hope you guys enjoy. I put some other stuff on the table and I do want to give you one, or pardon me, two final lessons before we continue on. So before I open things up to questions, I know that we have some folks who are wondering why the chocolate chips are here. Find the chocolate chips and try one. Mm. So what do we find here? Let's think about this in the building blocks of sensation way. High level of sugar, high level of fat, but not salt, right? Which wine do we think in our group can handle the chocolate chips? That would be number two, the Petite Syrah, mm. which is actually delicious with the chocolate. The challenge with Cabernet Sauvignon and chocolate chips, unless you're talking about a low sugar content in the chocolate, it can really make the wine taste too acidic, too thin, and too tannic. But a wine that's jammy and full of fruit and has a whisper of its own natural sweetness can handle chocolate as long as the day is long, right? Now, in addition to the chocolate chips, I know you have some smoked nuts out there. Find the smoked nuts. This is smoked almonds. I have blue diamond. Mm. Now, this is that unique taste that we get from grilling over a fire. You get that noticeable smokiness. Well, which of our wines do we think can handle this? Remember, like with like, do we want to put it with the Pinot Noir that has almost no new oak flavor to it? No. Do we want to put it with a Petit Syrah that has a little bit of oak flavor to it? No. The stronger the taste of caramelization, smoking, roasting, browning, what do we want to do? We want to go for the oakiest wine on the table, our Cabernet Sauvignon, number three. Mm. Absolutely delightful and delicious to the point where I need to pour myself some more Cabernet because I'm emptying my glass. Now, there is a food here that does work with the low oak item, which is our dill pickles. Mm. What's going on with the pickles? Lots of salt, right? Buckets of salt. But instead of fat, we have acidity. We have vinegar. Now, the vinegar is going to be extremely unflattering to the Cabernet, so don't do that. It's also going to be kind of unflattering to the Deputy Petite Syrah, so don't do that either. But if you want to try and find a perfect red wine and pickle pairing, try it with the Pinot Noir and you will be surprised. You will be surprised. Mm. Lovely. The two together actually work brilliantly in part because the acidity from the vinegar is counteracting the acidity from the Pinot Noir and they both taste brilliant, absolutely brilliant together. And then finally, I know this is a little scary, but some of you have been waiting for the hot sauce demonstration, so we have to go there. 
but I do it last because it takes your mouth a few minutes to recover. So after we do this, we're going to go to Q&A and leave the lecture portion of today's presentation behind. Now, I don't know which, if you're one of those people who likes the sweats, like my husband, he's not happy when there's hot sauce on food unless he's actually pouring sweat down the sides of his face. He, he loves the exhilaration of the burn. I am a wimp when it comes to spicy heat, which is why I'm just doing one of the mildest, the sort of classic buffalo hot sauce, the Franks. I want you to get a little hot sauce on your tongue. And I want you to notice something. Yes, there are flavors. I want you to ignore that. I want you to ignore the saltiness. I want you to ignore the acidity, all the things we've been talking about. I want you to focus on the burn. Do you feel that? That sensation of heat that you get. It's almost like the feeling you get when you burn your hand on a hot stove or on a hot pot. And it feels like your tongue is burning, even though we know it's not, right? It's a false sense of pain, but it is pain. But what's interesting about this is any wine that you taste after that, you can pick whichever one you've got in your glass. It doesn't matter. I want you to go and pick up one of your red wines after the hot sauce. And you'll notice something super interesting. It takes two, three seconds. Ah, there it is. It's like pouring a gas can on a barbecue. What happens is that the heat that you feel on your tongue gets amplified by the presence of alcohol in the drink. There's a reason why the cuisines that have the highest level of spicy heat, like think Indian cuisine or Mexican cuisine, are cultures where they do not drink spirits, <laughs> where they're not generally drinking wine either. If there's an alcoholic beverage on the table, what would it be? Oh, that would be the one with the lowest possible alcohol content, beer, right? Because generally speaking, spicy heat is amplified by alcohol, and the only way to tone it down to make it seem less painful on the tongue is to choose wines that have two qualities. One is lowest possible alcohol content, and the other quality is highest possible sugar content. Those are the two things that can offset the burn of spicy heat, which is why if I'm going to pair wine with spicy Indian food, I'm going to go straight to Moscato di Asti, something like that that has only 5% alcohol, but buckets of sugar and lots of flavor, and it's going to go beautifully with your curry or with whatever your spicy dish is. It really works brilliantly to keep the alcohol low and the sugar high when you encounter high levels of spicy heat. And with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and check in with Donna and see where we are in terms of questions. How are you doing over there? I haven't had much. Uh, I see a lot more has come into the chat box, but we, <laughs> oh yes, elegant Pinot Noir. Yes, I agree. Oh, and Pacific Time too. We have some people dropping out. But in any case, Donna, do we have more questions that I can answer on this? No, we didn't have any questions. We did have someone want you to repeat the the styles of which one felt to every category. And Lori, oh, sure. that in for them too, though. Sure. Well, I will just go back to sharing my screen for one second because, of course, we want to talk about the spectrum of style. Where did it go? And it is right up here at the beginning of the presentation. Ah, there we go. So. Our white styles are vivacious and voluptuous, so we don't have any in today's tasting. We've been tasting elegant Pinot Noir, sensuous Petite Syrah, and powerful Cabernet Sauvignon. But of course, we're hoping to do more tastings with the American Wine Society. I don't know, David, can you weigh in and, and let me know? Maybe if people enjoyed tonight's tasting, maybe we can schedule another one in the future. I think this has been a great time from my perspective anyway. Uh, but I think that it could be a great fun thing to do. And I should also remind people that there is at the very end here, I, I meant to bring it up, the fact that let's just talk about what a sommelier does when we decide what to drink with dinner. So the first thing I think about is that I pair wines based on similar color, flavor intensity, and weight, you know, pretty much the same way that most of us do. But the next thing I do is try and remember that salt versus sweet thing and factor in things like acidity and spicy heat. Try to remember how the senses respond to common seasonings in the sauces and preparations of the food that you're going to serve. 
And then that's when you start factoring in your own personal tastes. Are you a red wine person, a white wine person? That's when you can factor that into the decision-making process. And of course, relax and have some fun with it. Because at the end of the day, if, if wine decisions are stressing you out, then we have wine entirely backwards. There's a really simple way to correct that. It involves tilting the glass up higher than you normally do. To make sure that you're dumping it all down your throat. That will solve your stress issues with wine and food pairing decisions every time. In any case, I also wanted to remind people that our sensuous wines, if you liked our petite syrah, those wines in that category are all on sale through the 17th of May. We do offer 30% off for our Wine Society members. You might want to consider joining. But of course, there's 15% off to non-members if you're not interested. And the best of all is that six bottle or more orders through the end of May get free shipping. And while the sensuous sale is going on through the end of this week, next week is powerful. So if you like that Cabernet Sauvignon, the signature collection Cabernet from Raymond, that item is also going to be available and the whole powerful category will be on sale for the next week at the end of May. And with that, I'm going to go back and see if there's anybody who would like to unmute themselves and ask questions by voice, feel free to do so. I can see in the chat box that people are saying their tongue is tingling and enjoying the educational presentation. Amazing to learn about the salty versus sweet trick. I'm telling you, you can look like the like a rock star to your friends. Just pull this out. It's a great party trick in bars when you have the same wine for a group of people and you can show them the salt versus honey trick. Oh my goodness, it's, it's mind opening on so many levels. But yeah. I'm glad that everyone has had a good time. And I do wanna mention also that the three that you did today, the three wines are also available in our custom label program. So if you ever have um, a bottle you wanna put your own personal label on for business or personal reasons, all three of these are available for that. And then also um, I'm attaching a link now for Sarah's website if anyone's interested to become a wine ambassador like Sarah is for us as well. It's lots of fun learning with Marnie. If, if you can hear me, we're members of the American Wine Society. Peter and Leslie are our chair people, Lehigh County. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Thank you, Peter and Leslie, for introducing us. We will definitely come back and do another one if, if we get hooked up in the future. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed everything. So this, I have a question. How do you handle uh, different courses at a mill? What would be the primary concern, uh, common denominator? between the courses. Okay, so there are two different situations there. One is uh, if you're in a restaurant or if you're in a situation where you have enough people to be able to open a different wine on each course, then your problem is solved and you can just switch from one wine to another. In great restaurants, of course, we do know, I spent years as a fine dining sommelier, that not the same wine is gonna pair, partner well with everything from the appetizer, the middle course, to the entree, to the dessert. And so we, that's one of the reasons we have extensive by the glass offerings. That isn't as easy to do at home if you're entertaining and serving multiple courses at home. So what do you do? If you have to make a decision, and this happens often in business entertaining, you're handed the wine list and you have to pick just wines to go through. The safest thing to do, anytime you have a group that is all going to be having multiple courses and maybe they're not even eating the same things, aim for the middle of the spectrum. So pick lighter reds and heavier whites that are going to partner as well as possible across the board. I know I was talking about how yummy, for example, that Cabernet Sauvignon was with the steak. But if you have people at the same table who are eating ceviche or you know haddock or something, a lighter dish with shrimp or crab, you could easily get away with that Pinot Noir that we tried earlier and partner it just as well with the seafood as it does with the steak. It's kind of a luxury to be able to do a different wine with each dish. And I know that as a sommelier, I was spoiled. I absolutely got the best of both worlds in that regard. But aiming for the middle of the spectrum is usually the best way to go if you have to make a decision about one bottle to go with multiple different foods, if that makes sense. It does. Thank you. And thank you for the great presentation. Oh, you're welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed it.
Well, we had some fantastic wines. We had some fantastic samples of food. I think we learned a lot. I know we were going really, really super fast, but that's why we recorded it. So you can watch it again and go through and catch up with the pairing and with the partnerships. Chances are, if you are isolating at home and you open these wines tonight, there'll still be a little left tomorrow for you to go back through and do the partnerships with the pairings as well. But we're really, really thrilled to have met you. As I mentioned, I'm with Boisset Collection. Boisset Collection is a family-owned company. They're one of the top family-owned wine firms in France based in the Burgundy region. They're actually based in the region, well, Jean Charles actually grew up in playing in the vineyards of the Clos de Vougeot in his backyard. And the company has since acquired some wineries in California where Donna lives. Now Donna is out in wine country and we have Raymond Vineyards in Napa Valley, Deloche Vineyards in Russian River. We have Buena Vista in Sonoma Valley and so on. So we have kind of a Franco-American portfolio. And if you have any interest, if you are, are certainly, as I mentioned earlier, those of you who are in Pennsylvania and are stuck ordering wine online for the foreseeable future until the PLCB gets their act together, this is a company where the wine club that we offer is very unusual because we have multiple wineries that can serve both French and American wines through our wine society. It's really a rare treat. So go ahead and check through to the link that Donna had placed in the chat box. I'm sure she can put it in there again. Um, there will be information both about joining wine society to receive shipments every three months of our wines. And that's 100% customizable, by the way. If you're not a fan of the three wines I've chosen for that season, you're more than welcome to go in and change them. And anything in our full 125 bottle wine list is available for you to substitute at any time. Um, so we have a really fantastic wine society. We hope that some of you guys with the American Wine Society might consider becoming members. And of course, I should also mention that our spectrum of style we've been talking about, the sensuous wines are on sale this week, powerful wines the week after that, and then the final week of May, we'll be putting on both our elegant and our voluptuous whites. So elegant reds and voluptuous whites will both be on sale together in the final week of May. And, uh, and thank you, Donna, so much for putting the links in. I cannot talk and type at the same time. It's just beyond my skill set. So I always need a beautiful Vanna White out on the West Coast to do that for me. Great. Uh, Marnie, I just want to thank you for this. I think your presentation was so enlightening. And I think you and I met at a Chasford event so many years ago, but this is the first time I got to be a student. And I got to tell you, <laughs> I, learned, I have learned quite a bit during this talk. And I want to thank you for presenting wine in a way that we can think about how it fits into our lives instead of, you know, drilling down into the terroir and the producer and the barrels and the forests and everything else. I think that your presentation was so pragmatic and so useful. And uh, thank you so much for doing it. Oh, you're welcome. You know, this is something I've prided myself on for a long time. I only recently came on board with Boisse in part because I love what they're doing, finding a way to connect the wine makers to the wine drinkers directly without having to go through that awful three-tier system where there are merchants in between who don't care about the customer, right? But um, this is something that has always really meant a lot to me to try and think about the end user of wine. There is so much detail out there. If you want to learn about wine, you can spend your entire life learning about the, the ins and outs of enology or of grape growing or any facet of it. It can just absorb your entire brain capacity, right? But what I like to do is I like to focus on where the rubber meets the road. Let's, let's talk about flavor. Let's talk about taste. Let's talk about experience. Let's talk about the, the, the real feeling that we get. I mean, this is where the lifeblood of wine to me really is. I mean, if it wasn't, we would all be, you know, drinking craft beer and cocktails by now. <laughs> well, thank you. It, anything else, anybody? Just, just my thanks oh. again, Barney. I really appreciated this. It was very educational. You know, I hope to do it again. Fantastic. Well, you just tell David that you really enjoyed that Boisset presentation with Marnie, and I'm sure he, he, he has some connections and some strings he can pull to make that happen for you. You're hearing that, right? <laughs> I'm hearing it. Yes. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
Well, again, we hope you enjoyed the wines. We really do appreciate the opportunity through, unfortunately, Sarah, who was unable to join us because she had a, a time zone work call issue that kept her off the call. But Sarah has been our connection to the American Wine Society, and I really appreciate the assistance that she has given us in connecting with David and bringing this kind of content to you. And since we're all stuck in our homes, this virtual tasting idea seems like a great way for us to keep connecting. I can see so many faces who are, you know, we're, we're all stuck at home. You know, we miss our friends. We all need a drink in this situation. And, and this seems like a great solution to all three problems. Marnie, this is Peter from Lehigh Valley. Let's assume that you're Hi. going to do another presentation. And uh, would, would this be the vivacious and voluptuous whites next time? We could, we could, but we could also talk about just about anything that you like. I, I think my next suggestion might be to take a deep dive into one of the most important concepts in the world of wine, which is old world versus new world. And this is something that so few companies in California are really able to do beautifully. But because our company is based in Burgundy in France, which is, I mean, ground zero for fine wine as we know it, as we all know is Burgundy, I would love to do an old world, new world presentation for you, David. Now, unfortunately, there are some states where state level regulations prevent us from shipping our imported wine. So it does mean that I think there are, uh, is it eight or 10 states, Donna, something like that, where we're unable to ship our imports. But that would be so much fun. And I could absolutely recommend American substitutes for the French wines, if necessary, because we do have, because we have French trained winemakers, we have wines from places like Marin County and Sonoma County that have French sensibilities and taste almost French, even when technically they're not. That would be fabulous. We would love to do that. David? Oh, cool. <laughs> I see him nodding his head and talking, but his, he's muted right now. There we go. Oh, I, I have heard you. I've heard you. You know, uh, we have to cancel the conference this year. I think in lieu of the conference, we are going to line up some superstars for virtual tastings. And I'm sure we can include, include some Pennsylvania superstars like Marnie. Great. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. That would be awesome. Thank you. I would be honored to be invited and, and very much thrilled to be introduced to your network through this program that you guys are doing. You know, you're doing such a great job, David, in helping people stay connected through wine because ultimately, you know, the, the famous quote is that water separates the people of the world, but wine unites us. In this situation, I think it's, um, I think it's actually COVID that's separating the people of the world right now, and wine can still unite us anyway. Do that. Can you hear you? I guess I need it. <laughs> okay, great. And um, I need to get Donna, thank you for answering that question about North Carolina. Yes, we can ship to North Carolina. Um, it might help, Donna, if you, could you include the link to our states of operation? We can sell wine and ship wine to consumers in 40 states out of 50 right now. There's been some changes in direct shipping regulation over recent years. And just like right now, Kentucky is in this process of opening at the moment, which is super exciting for us because we have people there who've been asking us for the wines and we haven't been able to ship them. So that's a lovely, lovely, lovely thing. And anybody, absolutely anybody, I'm going to go ahead and put my email address in the chat box. It's really simple. It's just marnie.old at voise.com. Easy to remember. And that way, anybody who has any questions can always email me and I will forward you to the customer care team or to Sarah Warner if it's something to do with sales for the American Wine Society. And, um, and yeah, we can make sure to take care of you guys. Thank you so much, Donna. There it is, states of operation. So there are strange, weird limits in some states like maximum number of cases per year or a certain brand might be excluded for some reason, but the link is right there. So anybody who's curious about whether our wines are available in your state for home delivery, can just click through to that link and check it out. Well, thank you very much, Marnie. I would um, ask all of our AWS members to stay tuned for other great tasting opportunities that Marnie will have you back either virtually or live in person at, an, at a future AWS conference, like maybe 2021 in Atlantic City. 
you know, that's so local for me, David, as you know, I live in Philadelphia. Technically right now, no. I'm actually in Canada. I, I'm crossing uh, international boundaries to join you today, but I live in Philly and I would think that a Atlantic City Conference sounds super, super convenient. I know, Marnie. Marnie, you're a pride of the Keystone State. You really are. Oh, thank you. <laughs> And for those of you who are Pennsylvania based, just so you know, I write a wine column every Thursday in the Philadelphia Inquirer, if you are not familiar already. Terrific. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you. Thank you, Marnie. Thank you, everyone at Boise. And uh, have a great night. And please be well. Thank you for joining us and for enjoying our wines. We hope to see you guys again sometime soon in person. Thank you.